In uh, ancient India, around about 2,500 years ago, there emerged a bunch of people, um, or a bunch of movements, I guess, um, that kind of basically said that the world is full of misery and the best thing to do is to escape from the world. Uh, and what you got was Jainism and Buddhism, and there were many other schools at the time, but the ones that have that, that coalesced the most firmly and have lasted the longest have been Jainism and Buddhism, and elements of strong elements in Hinduism. Renunciation: the world is full of ills. Get away from it. <coughs> they, you know, celebrated things like asceticism, celibacy, self-denial. Um, uh, that sort of thing, getting off the wheel of existence, because the wheel of existence, existence itself, is onerous. There's ultimately, when you discover, as Zopfi's caveman did, what reality is, it leads to a state of existential horror and existential panic. Um, <clears throat> so you have the paths of Gotama and Mahavira, Buddha and the founder of Jainism. Um, the Jains were out and out antinatalists, as were the the um, Buddhists, to a certain extent. Uh, and even Hinduism has a strong and probably, I would say, dominant uh, thread of life denial in it. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing, though, is one almost gets the impression that that spawned something of a counter-reformation, because the original uh, life-denying sets, like the, the Buddha and Mahavira and people like that, were rebelling against luxury, against sense gratification, against um, you know anything that really seems to have value in this pointless, unchanging, or sorry, utterly changing universe. Why would you believe in any of this? None of it lasts. Entropy is built right into the universe itself. There's evidence that ancient Indian scientists grasped this. You can actually reason out entropy. You don't need to be a modern physicist to figure it out. The universe is doomed. <laughs> um, so who in their right mind would celebrate it? <clears throat> well, think that through even further. <laughs> the universe as it's now constituted is doomed. But it came from somewhere, didn't it? That, that'll just repeat itself, won't it? Um, and a lot of philosophers, they're less well known, but they're increasingly well known in the modern world, develop something called Tantra which is an Indian word for loom, or a Sanskrit word for loom, weaving everything together. What the tantrics do is almost the exact opposite of what the Buddhists and the Jains were trying to do. They said, life may not be inherently worth living. They would agree, to a certain extent, with Thomas Ligotti, with the last line, uh, of the conspiracy against the human race, that there is nothing of inherent value in existence, or something like this. Yeah, that's fine, that the tantric would say. But that doesn't mean that it can't be made to be worth it. Um, you have to actually intervene to make your life worth living. Uh, the Buddha said, you have 20 dancing girls, you spend the night with them, you wake up, nothing has changed. Um, the tantric would say, you're not doing it right. <laughs> you actually expect this to change something? Change something for the better, permanently, whatever? Um, that's not going to happen. We live in a universe where change is more or less not just the only constant, but it's the only thing there is, is change flux. There's only the now. Nietzsche's moment of becoming. That's all there is. Um, in a few other threads I was discussing with people, they sort of said, what really horrifies me is the idea that, and I, I don't believe this, but you know, it's possible, I suppose. My son's pounding on the door there. Um, <clears throat> what really horrifies me is the idea of my own existence, and my own existence as being a constant that will never, that, that'll just keep repeating itself for all eternity. Kind of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. Nietzsche sort of said, you know, okay, what if existence is all there is? If there's no such thing as non-existence, if there's just existence, <laughs> you know, like, what do you do with that? Ah, the tantrics are ready for that. The tantrics are ready. They say, what you do is you use the tools that are provided in existence to make your own existence worth it. And nobody can do this for you, by the way. 
and you can't do this for anyone else. You have to do it yourself. Now, <clears throat> Inmendum just made a video recently, today I think. I don't really watch a lot of his videos, but for some strange reason, the title of this one put the hook in me, and I watched it, and it was just about the first two minutes, I'll leave a link below, where he almost conceded the point. Now, I know this is going to infuriate him to say that I, I'm saying that he's backing down or something like this. I'm not. I'm just sort of kind of surprised that he would have made the point that he made. The subject was castration. He said, why would I want to do that? Because, you know, the libido is one of the few things that has at least the possibility. He disavows that possibility, but he says it's one of the few things that has the possibility of saying life, uh, that, that, that could sort of say that the keeping the wheel of existence turning, or as he would put it, I guess, is, um, I forget the term that he actually used, but the, the mechanism would be worth, the, the hamster wheel would be worth running on. He didn't say it that way, but uh, watch the link, uh, the first couple of minutes. He makes an interesting um, series of statements that I found completely inconsistent with his previous positions. So, <clears throat> I, in, in a way, he's there goes my son again. He really wants to get in here because he wants to know what's going on. Not now. Not now. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway. Anyway, he... Um, <laughs> he... Um, sorry about that. Ugh. Not now. <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to... I'm not going to redo this video. I don't care. It's... Uh, <laughs> This is going to have to stay in it. Um, <clears throat> so, he s makes a few statements that fascinated me and seem to sort of, as I say, go completely against the grain of everything he previously said. Now, I'm not saying that he meant it to be this way, and I could be misinterpreting what he's saying or whatever. I don't want to get into that. But I'd like to explore what he said, and I'd like to, s you know, I'd like to see what he would say in terms of. Um, what he said concerning the idea of not being castrated, of wanting to keep your libido going. It's one of the few things that may make life vaguely bearable, is the libido, the orgasm. Um, and he said, you know, the yin and yang thing. He says the, um, the gratification followed by satiation, followed by uh, a need, followed by gratification, followed by satiation, followed by a need. Now, the interesting thing about that is, we're looking at time as a linear thing, and it's very hard for us to get that idea out of our minds. Um, because when you say, when you plot it on the graph like that, and you say, um, need, gratification, satiation, need, gratification, satiation, going on forever, looks pretty horrible, right? That's the existential panic that I referred to, because you're stuck forever. Well, wait a minute. That's a linear conception of time, which isn't necessarily a correct one, um, or the only conception of time. What if just the moment of becoming, existence itself, is all that there is? Um, what if that's all that there is? that existence itself is like there's no option of non-existence. We can prove existence, we can't prove non-existence. Um, at least we can prove it to ourselves, I'll put it that way. I can't demonstrate to anyone else that I exist, but I certainly can't demonstrate that something doesn't exist, concretely. <clears throat> but I can satisfy myself about my own existence. Um, I exist. That's it. I'm stuck with that. There is no before or after. <laughs> there's only the moment of becoming. There's only the moment of now, the moment of existence, the fact, the brute, blunt fact of existence. That's all there is. There is no um, past or present or future or whatever. There is just existence itself. Even present is kind of a misnomer in this schema of things when you just consider pure existence. This is Tantra. <laughs> um... And Tantra says, the Buddhists and the Jains and the life deniers were right to a certain extent, but they posit something that, A, they can't really demonstrate to be the case. You can't demonstrate that there is such a place or a state called nirvana. 
You can only experience it, I suppose. And and by the same token, you can't really demonstrate your own existence. So, you know, again, the, these things tend to sort of even each other out. <clears throat> they end up being stalemates or deadlocks or whatever when you when you get into this uh, this argument in terms of different conceptions of time, different conceptions of existence, different conceptions of past, present, future, different conceptions of what now and what then means and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> but they look at that and they say, okay, I get what you're saying, that the senses are kind of a dead end or they can be a dead end or existence itself can seem onerous and horrible um, if looked at from a certain perspective interesting take on the, from, on the Jane view of things it's kind of interesting as well because I am not a Jane and in fact I kind of I don't know I like what the Janes have to say and I love the techniques they've developed but uh, it's not for me you look at the, my neck it's Anakantavad which is Anakantavada which is the theory of multiple or infinite viewpoints um, you take that and you apply it to Jainism and you say, okay, I, I get what you're saying. In some ways, the wheel of existence or life or, or, or human in, the human condition is pretty horrific, isn't it? Uh, we have suffering, we have deprivations, we have frustrations, we have disappointments, we have all kinds of things that really seem to militate towards a position of not really being terribly impressed by life. But back to Ligotti again. There is nothing of inherent value in existence. There is nothing inherently valuable in existence. Now, <laughs> I like that because, again, there's two ways you can read that. There's nothing inherently of positive or negative value. <laughs> it's all, it all depends on circumstance. It all depends on point of view. It all depends on what meaning you put on these things or what meaning you refuse to put on these things, this kind of thing. Um, and the Jains said, sense gratification is a disappointment. Um, belief in the future is a disappointment. Belief in anything is a disappointment. Um, following any kind of ism is ultimately a disappointment. Um, existence itself is horrible because of the things that we have to do to stay in existence, etc., etc., etc. Well, apply uh, perspectivism or anacontabata to that, and what you get is, well, in some ways it is pretty horrible. Yes, I'm not going to dispute that. But that's not all there is to the picture. In some ways, it isn't. In some ways, sense gratification, um, active participation in the universe and in your own life, and active intervention to influence the quality of your own existence, um, can actually alter the value of um, your own existence, uh, the brute fact that you exist. <coughs> It's not a question, it's not so much that the, that the senses are bad and they lead to nowhere. It's when you actually believe that the senses and gratifying them actually has positive value, absolutely. There's nothing inherently valuable or nothing of inherent value, Ligotti, in sense gratification, but there's nothing of inherent negative value, which is what kind of the Jains and the Buddhists and most of Hinduism says, that gratification of the senses is almost invariably um, you, you run out of steam at a certain point. Again, we're at a linear conception of time, right? But again, that doesn't mean anything in terms of just dealing with the existence, the existence factor. Almost makes the ride worth it. Uh, and Mendham said it almost makes the game worth playing. I really, truly don't want to straw man him. But to me, that's a massive concession. Um, because you can sort of say, I've seen him say in other videos, that sex is kind of disgusting and, you know, it's really pointless and there's all this other crap mixed up in it, like mind games and relationships and non-relationships and trying to manage the whole thing and, ugh, just a big headache. Yes, but it can be done, or at least... The ancient tantrics said that it it was worth attempting to do it, and they developed this entire what they call a, a sadhana, which is sort of a path of existence. To say we're not so much saying that the Jains are wrong, or that the Buddhists are wrong, or the life deniers in general are wrong, is as, as we're saying, well, there's another way of looking at all of the the things that 
they say are so horrible. You can learn how to master your senses without having to dull them and kill them. You can use sense gratification to work for you as opposed to make you feel empty and, I don't know, hung over the next day type thing. Um, <clears throat> you can actually love that pointless merry-go-round of need, sati satiation, or sorry, need, gratification, satiation leading to further need. Because then you could just satiate it again, right? <laughs> and then you get gratification again when the you know the um, when you're at the satiation point and you go back to the need, then you just gratify it again and satiate it and that kind of thing. And again, it's not an eternal process because there is no eternity. <laughs> you know, there's there's just now. There's just existence itself. Again, I always harp on this the bit that. That where, they, where they, the tantrics insist that you have to look reality square in the face. You have to look nihilism or the, the what Nietzsche called the greatest weight um, right in the face. You have to look at that, and you have to you have to look Zapfi's caveman, his his moment of existential horror. You have to stare straight into the eyes of that monster, um, and it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but really, why not do it? <laughs> What's going to happen? Um, you're going to get a shock. Everything is going to, you're going to be completely disoriented. Um, but you will have gotten off that merry-go-round. <laughs> if you put your mind exclusively into the moment of becoming, and meditation and all this stuff is really necessary to do this. You really have to train your mind to do this, which is really the point here. Um, why not do it? What would your objection to be to doing it? You know, they would ask the Jains, you're going to starve yourself to death and say that, you know, this is, this is the only way to deal with all of this, or this is a smart way to deal with all of this, or self-denial, or whatever. They would say, well, that, well, it's all very well, but why don't you tell me why I shouldn't follow this path? And, and to be fair, the tantrics almost never bothered to engage with other groups like this. And they're very secretive, actually, um, and aristocratic and exclusive, even. <clears throat> Most people find this kind of thinking disturbing. In the West, I guess it would come into the esoteric, satanic tradition. Um, people are frightened by this. People are frightened by having their notions of time and space brutally challenged like this. Um, <clears throat> but again, you sort of... The interesting thing is, it's not that anyone is saying that life is inherently of value, uh, positive or negative. It might not be worth living, but it might not be not worth living inherently. But again... It can be made to be worth living. You can make your own existence worth it, more than worth it. But you have to take the initiative. Ligotti's line, there's nothing in, of inherent value in existence, is almost, if you ask me, a um, kind of thing. I'm not playing that game. And there's an element of spite in it, if you ask me. Um... Again, that's fine. That's because he's only spite is really it only affects him when he's being spiteful like that. Maybe there is nothing of inherent value in existence. But there's nothing of inherent value, positive or negative, in existence. But again, it can be made to be of value, positive or negative. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would say that. Um, we're at a point where I think humanity is reaching something of an existential crisis because of the internet, because of the massive um, increase, proliferation of communications technology where we can discuss and throw everything uh, around, every idea, discuss everything. And what you're left with is just the bare, brute fact of existence. And now what? well, uh, you either, as they say in Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying, but really that's all very well. What does it mean to live and what does it mean to die? <laughs> um, 
an interesting video that Inmendim made, and one that I would never have expected him to have made. It's nice to be back. <laughs>